Within the world of darkness, supernatural creatures of your worst nightmares lurk around every corner, spreading dread and death wherever they stalk their prey. However, whilst these beings have a horrifying reputation, none compare to the man who cultivated his image of insurmountable monstrosity, all whilst he lived and breathed as an ordinary mortal. An ordinary mortal with sadistic and tyrannical ways of pursuing his bloodied goals. Most deem this man as a figure of pure fiction, a boogeyman which sends shivers down the spines of even the eldest of vampires. Known to have tormented both kindred and kine alike, he spared no quarter towards any that opposed him, and often manipulated those close enough to his side to satiate his taboo desires. His very name is enough to curdle Vitae, and his victims total in the tens of thousands if not much, much more. From cutting down great swathes of civilizations with his notorious blade, to skewering the vanquished atop sharpened stakes, he is the very epitome of death and devastation. Some know him as the son of the dragon, others Vlad the Impaler, but most are aware of his infamous title, Count Dracula. But first, if you enjoy grim tales from dark universes or want to know more about the world of darkness, perhaps leave a like or even subscribe as it helps the channel immensely. Before Dracula earned his infamy through acts of blood-curdling violence, we must first observe how this dynasty of Transylvanian nobles became aware of the world of darkness, and more importantly, the machinations of the immortal vampires. We must first start with Dracula's father, a man known as Vlad the Dragon. During the time of his reign, Canite laws such as the Masquerade were not formally in place across the world, yet a common courtesy known as the Silence of Blood was very much active. To keep the knowledge of vampire kind between those of supernatural descent, and more importantly, to evade the burning pyres of the Inquisition, which would happily massacre all known bloodsuckers from the face of the earth. However, in Transylvania, the Silence of Blood was more so a formality. The vampires of Transylvania and Wallachia were fond of displaying their so-called undead strength before the local warlords and nobles of the land, and often relied on this show of power to force these mortal rulers into a form of subjugation, to persuade them to enact their bidding. Vlad the Dragon was no exception to this practice. The dragon hailed from a family known as the Basarab, which, within the world of darkness, were revenants who swore blood oaths to the Zemishi. Within the early 15th century, the Ravnos kindred known as Durga Sin had come into conflict with Anarch raids across Romania, which not only spoiled the power balance of the area, but increasingly threatened the unlives of the Ravnos elders which resided there. As you may well know, these Anarch raids were the first embers of the Sabbat, and their vicious war against the elders of vampire society. To quell such a attacks, Durga's Sin concocted a plan to utilize the armies of a local noble to stamp out these kindred in her midst, and thus she turned to Vlad the Dragon to purge these Anarchs through any means necessary. Upon consulting Vlad, she revealed to the ruler the world of darkness, and taught him the secrets of vampire society which lay just beyond his mortal sight, filling his mind with diabolical secrets, including many which betrayed various clans. She gained his trust as one of his most valuable advisors, and the dragon soon began to utilize his armies to stamp out these Canite warriors from his territory. Vlad the Dragon had knelt before Durga's Sin, and throughout the years of his reign, he was bestowed with immortal secrets which would tempt any power-hungry being. This was the beginning of the Draculesti line, intertwining once again with the world of vampires, a history which would only continue to deepen as their ties with the Canites only strengthened. 
But this tale tonight is not about simple mortal politics, however gory they may come to be. The true horrors would reveal themselves through the son of the dragon, a man famed in his mortal life for being abominably cruel to his enemies, which would only further spark his desire to enter into the realms of the occult. Vlad the Impaler's tale begins within the year 1431, the very year in which the Holy Roman Emperor Sigismund invited his father to his court. Accompanied by his wife and his three sons, the dragon knelt before the emperor and swore fealty to the empire. In return, he was granted a hereditary title and was given jurisdiction of the Transylvanian districts of Amlas and Fagaras. This, in theory, would cement his family's lineage for centuries as defenders of the new Order of the Dragon. However, Vlad the Dragon was a deceptive man, and he knew that true power could not be earned from simply bending the knee. The dragon, cunning as he was, saw to it that he would pretend to uphold the Empire's ideals within his lands, whilst aiding their greatest adversary, the Ottoman Turks, in their raids within his jurisdiction. However, all the whilst he allowed this bloodshed to wreak havoc within minor Transylvanian settlements, the dragon relayed every battle plan from the Sultan himself straight to his eldest son, Masia who led a campaign of fierce and devastating counterattacks against the Turks, steering the tides of war from both sides. While some may think this counterintuitive, the dragon knew the game he wished to play, to pit the two forces against each other, that being the Sultan and the Holy Roman Emperor. For a young Dracula to witness these events play out before him as a mere boy, it would be something of which he would mirror deep into his unlife. Yet, this is where his tale of bloodshed begins. By 1438, the dragon had begun to conduct his raids for the Turks openly, scouring villages across Transylvania. On one of his many assaults, Sultan Murad accompanied him, but also his two youngest sons, Radu and Vlad, a mere boy of just seven years old. Each assault was worth its weight in blood and flesh, with these attacks wiping out whole settlements off the face of the earth, left to burn within the cinders of time. However, they did not go unnoticed. By 1444, after years of devastation, the Hungarian king swore to avenge these atrocities, yet this would not be until the dragon wished to play another card of deception. However, this play would come with deadly consequences. Vlad the dragon, having played the warring factions within Transylvania for years, offered military knowledge of the Turkish forces to Janos Hunyadi, the then general of the Transylvanian armies. As battle after battle ensued, Hunyadi's armies fought tenaciously against the Turks. However, However, they could not secure full victory, and were eventually quelled. Hunyadi's resistance, bolstered by the dragon's intelligence, were formidable enough that he was granted the title of Voivode of Transylvania in 1447. Yet such pleasantries were not in store for the patriarch of the Draculesti line. The Sultan Murad, believing treachery was afoot, summoned the dragon to his court immediately. Accepting, Dracul and his two youngest sons crossed the Danube to answer to the Sultan's demands. The dragon was accused of disloyalty and was imminently placed in chains and was forced under duress to swear an oath of obeisance. To make sure that the dragon understood the severity of these oaths, the Sultan ordered for his two sons, Radu and Vlad, to be placed in his own custody as hostages under house arrest within the city of Egregos. Dracula was, at this point, only 11 years old. There, they were both thrown into the midst of the Turkish court, where they were forced to learn every trick to survive. Radu, the youngest boy, was singled out as the weaker willed of the two and was set aside for manipulation. He would make for a prime candidate for the Wallachian throne. Vlad, however, garnered a reputation much like his father for trickery, cunning, and insubordination. He had an impeccably strong will and would not make for a prized puppet of which the Sultan could use. Even within the Sultan's own harem, Vlad inspired fear within the guards. 
from his very presence alone. There, the two boys learned a great deal of knowledge from their captors, yet Vlad sought to harness the most. He learned the Turkish language, the arts of warfare, yet also delved into Greek philosophy, Sufi mysticism, and the Arab classics. However, the young Vlad had also delved down a dark path, one which would carve out the future before his very eyes. From his father, long ago, he had heard tales of the vampire, the great inner dealings of the Zemishi, and the powers which manipulated the world behind the veil of undeath. But now he had access to the great secrets of the eastern lands and the machinations of the Cainites. He noticed slight hints of the Banu Hakim's manipulations, who were utilizing the expansion of the Ottoman Empire for their own gain. And thus, his descent into the occult grew. However, tragedy would strike twice for the boy, during the time of which he plotted to escape the clutches of Sultan Murad to travel back to his ancestral lands. His father, Vlad the Dragon, had been assassinated, allegedly by conspirators within Romania, of which some claim to have been vampiric in nature. The Sultan saw a great opportunity before him. The son of the dragon's wrath was unparalleled, and his ferocity and hunger for revenge greatly intrigued the Sultan, so much so that he allowed him a small retinue to wreak havoc and bloodshed across Transylvania. Emboldened by a fury which strangled his very soul, Dracula marched this army north and charged relentlessly towards the capital of Wallachia, Turga Viste. The assault was relentless and released the great rage which seeped out of the young Dracula. Vladislav II, the Voivode of Wallachia, barely escaped with his life. The Sultan, upon hearing this news, was rejoiced. The ability to steer Dracula with his unbridled rage was invaluable, yet Vlad knew of his perilous situation. With enemies to the north and the Sultan to the south, Dracula staked his claim within Wallachia, yet he knew it would not last for long. For two months he ruled Wallachia, yet felt the insecurity of this region all around. The very assassins that had dispatched his father were still a great threat for the man, and after a brief reign, he fled to Moldavia. There, Dracula sought an alliance with the Prince of Moldavia, yet also allied with Hunyadi, the very man who sought to retake his father's territories. Janos Hunyadi became the boy's military mentor, and thus Dracula saw to it to further his education in the art of war. Hunyadi and Dracula undertook a campaign to retake Amlas and Fagaras, and after a period of bloodshed and strife, the son of the dragon soon walked triumphantly within his father's domain. Having liberated his ancestral lands, Dracula soon returned to his studies into the occult. Having recollected the legends bestowed upon him by his father, he sought information regarding the Transylvanian vampires, primarily the Zemishi. He sought secrets from elder travelers, who taught Dracula many of the customs of the elusive Zemishi. Yet it is said that these travelers may have been Ravnos spies. Vlad was also tutored by Romanian sages, and was lectured upon the great struggle between the youngest of the vampires and the eldest, an event which would come to be known as the Anarch Revolt. Canite legends also state that Dracula sent out forces to locate Durgis Sin, confidant and advisor to Vlad the Dragon, who had betrayed various secrets, especially regarding the Zemishi, to the mortal noble. The more Dracula learned of the Zemishi and the Banu Hakim, the more paranoid he became of enemies yet unseen. Such a prospect terrified him to the core, yet would inspire a great quest to conquer a fear so absolutely it would drive him straight into the belly of the beast. This period of relative stability within Dracula's life, however, was short-lived. For the Ottoman Empire had begun its fervent expansion once more. Constantinople fell in 1453, and Murad's successor, Mehmed II, was vastly gaining territory. Outraged by this, Dracula's wrath once again began to seep through every faculty within his domain. Ruling with an iron fist and to instill loyalty through brute force, Dracula summoned a force of 20,000 soldiers and marched upon Sibiu. He instructed his army 
to do the unthinkable. The soldiers brutally dispatched the city, taking the lives of 10,000 citizens within their wake. The devastation of the pillaging and the aftermath seen soon after saw the casualties rise immensely, outnumbering those seen by the Ottoman raids prior. However, this was but the first phase of Dracula's fury. In 1456, Hunyadi assembled his own force to combat the Ottomans to the south, yet gave instructions to Dracula to remain in Sibiu to defend the city. At this point, Mehmed had formed an alliance with one of Dracula's most sour of adversaries, Vladislav II. But Hunyadi knew he could utilize Vlad's destructive power when the time arose. He gave Dracula the freedom to travel south, yet only upon the order to lead an offensive when Mehmed and Vladislav's forces were weakened. As Hunyadi waged his brutal campaign, Dracula had already begun to amass his forces. However, instead of solely levying troops from nearby villages, the Son of the Dragon recruited a vast amount of mercenaries, outlaws, and travelers into his horde. Upon receiving the command from Hunyadi to attack, Dracula knew that his force was one to be truly reckoned with, and one which would not relent until the enemy before him was decimated. Surging into Wallachia, the army purged the forces of Vladislav, fighting tooth and nail to dispatch every warrior into a flood of blood and gore. Upon that horrific battlefield, Dracula finally came face to face with his sorrowful adversary, and with sword in hand, confronted Vladislav personally. After a brief yet gut-wrenching duel, Dracula gained the upper hand over his foe, and there upon that field in Wallachia, the son of the dragon drove his sword through the heart of Vladislav. Dracula's oath of vengeance was now complete, and as the Prince of Wallachia, you would assume he had accomplished his heart's desire. Yet Dracula yearned for more, and would not stop until his appetites were fully satiated. At 25 years old, Dracula had driven the Ottomans from Transylvania, and the boyars of Tara Romanesca heralded him as the savior of the lands. Yet, Dracula knew that a ruler of such lands could not maintain dominance by a savior's reputation. Thus, he did as his father once did before, and reinstated that he would rule with unquestionable authority. He sent word to the mayor of Brazov in a bid to forebode the gruesome events which would soon unfold. He simply stated, Pray, think that when a man or a prince is powerful at home, then he will do as he wills. When he is without power, another one more powerful than he will overwhelm him and do as he wishes. Transylvania under Dracula was a bleak existence. He became notorious for his demonstrations of absolute law and authority. He enlisted the assistance of the Armas, a group of executioners which would dispatch his method of justice via the axe or the stake, wherever he felt necessary. It is said in Canaanite legend, Dracula employed these tactics to quell the fear of unseen enemies notably vampires, who lurked within mortal settlements. He employed fear tactics and displays of terror to showcase what it meant to trespass against him. Whole villages would be massacred and raised upon great timber spikes, presenting impaled carcasses across the Transylvanian landscape. The theory was, in legend, that if hundreds were impaled in such a way, the kindred amongst the kine would also fall victim to his atrocities, as it was believed that vampires themselves were behind the assassination of his father. Yet, tragedy would strike Dracula once more. After a few months of taking the title of Prince of Wallachia, he uncovered that his eldest brother, Mercia was murdered by the boyars. Dracula first summoned a great feast on the Puenari Hills, where great amounts of citizens would delight in the celebrations. However, Dracula's wrath, emboldened by grief, turned these festivities sour. Encircled by his troops, he forced the citizens to build a great castle, still dressed in their Easter clothes. Stone by stone, they built this great monument in his name, the infamous Poinari Castle. After uncovering the grave of his brother, 
and finding him buried face down. Dracula saw to it to summon the boyars and interrogate them mercilessly. If their answers did not suffice, the Armas impaled them upon spikes outside of Puenari Castle. Gruesome myths and tales were told of Dracula's morbid delight, born out of his vengeful fury. He was said to partake in eating the corpses upon these stakes and drinking their blood, believing that if he dipped his food within their gore, he would be bolstered in strength by this taboo act. Within 1457, Dracula returned to the warpath, conducting raids upon Saxon territories within Transylvania. He spared no quarter during his assaults and burned homes of various Saxon villages, especially where insurrectionists were rife. For his brutality, he was gifted Burkow Castle, yet his campaigns did not cease. The mayor of Brazov during this time had been showing support for a rival of the Draculesti line, a Dynasty ruler known as Dan III. The Dynasty was recognized also as a rightful claimant of the dragon's former lands, being that of Amlas and Fagaras. It would not be long before more governors and mayors supported the Dynasty claim, with the mayor of Sibiu pledging his support and the Saxons vowing revenge against Dracula. Unbeknownst to mortals, however, a great plot was brewing behind the shadows. The Zamishi were planning to expand their influence within the region, and the Cabals thus conspired to embrace feudal lords, to enact their bidding through the ties of the blood. Two feudal lords were selected for embrace, an illegitimate son of Vlad the Dragon and Dan III. However, secrets soon passed to Dracula's ears, being engulfed within the occult himself. When he learned of such a plot, his anger raged through him once more and swore that he would spare no effort to destroy these foul pretenders through any means necessary. Vlad the Impaler had accrued enough power to fully confront the Zamishi elders, a feat that his father could never have achieved, even with the aid of Durga Sin. With this power, he would march his armies across Transylvania, pillaging villages and impaling their populations to root out just a few singular vampires. Entire fields became forests of sharpened stakes, presenting the impaled corpses of his victims on this path of sheer nightmarish wrath. He burned monasteries to the ground to pry the fiends from their hiding, but nothing could stop the inevitable machinations of the kindred. In 1459, Dan III entered the embrace. Fueled by bitter rage, Dracula enacted scorched earth tactics to strike at the heart of the Dynasty forces. Thousands were slaughtered in this campaign, yet Dan was a more formidable foe than those before him. Despite leaving fields and woodland littered with impaled corpses, Dracula could not best Dan through sheer strength in numbers alone. The Dynasty ruler had the Impaler's supporters arrested in 1460 and led a vast counterattack, taking the domains of Vlad the Dragon and fought all the way to the Wallachian border. However, in time, the people of Wallachia turned against Dan III, as their hearts were corrupted by the insurmountable fear placed in them through the Impaler alone. By the cover of night, Dracula's allies found the Dynasty ruler's haven and seized the Canite ruler and took him to Puenari Castle. In a private ceremony, Dracula brutally staked the fiend, locking him into a state of paralysis. There, he would extract the newly embraced Samishi's blood and would satiate his lust for power by drinking his vitae. Intoxicated by the great power this blood gave him, Dracula vowed to not only bring war against the mortal populace, but against the empires of the Canites. He took multiple vials of Vitae from the paralyzed Dynasty kindred and gifted them to his trusted executioners, the Armas. Dracula was no longer content with ruling the living. Dracula wanted to conquer the kingdoms of the undead and to satisfy his immortal goal. By 1460, Dracula prepared for his penultimate campaign, one which would ravage the territories of Amlas. Chasing after the kindred Vlad the Monk, he torched entire settlements to the ground and pursued this vampire with inquisitorial zeal. Ironically, Dracula had expected the mortal populace of Amlas to support his inquisition, yet they did not rally at his side. Appalled by their disloyalty, Dracula ordered for a priest to lead the citizens to an open field, and there, the Impaler would plant another forest. This became known 
as the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre. Once Dracula had assumed absolute control over Transylvania, he set his sights on his final goal the Ottoman Empire. Aided by the Hungarian king, the Impaler set forth to Turkish-controlled Istanbul, and fought his way to the very gates of that hallowed city. Despite having fought tenaciously, Dracula's forces had taken many casualties, and he urgently sent messages out to the king to request reinforcements before the Feast of St. George. However, that aid never came. In 1462, Dracula was sent on the retreat all the way back to Turgoviste. Yet by the cover of night, he had planned to assault the Sultan's encroaching army, to assassinate the ruler himself. With a small force, he made his way to the Ottoman encampment, and ordered the slaughter of as many foes as possible, taking great care to dispatch the commanders first. However, as the bloodshed erupted into frenzy, the Sultan was able to escape, and Dracula was once again forced to retreat. In Turgoviste, the Ottoman Turks encroached upon the city. However, before them was the most horrific sight they had ever witnessed. A forest of stakes covered the surrounding lands, all the way up to the very walls of the city. Rotting bodies littered the skies, with ravens plucking at their cadavers. 20,000 stakes were placed, and all the Turks could do was watch. However, the Sultan commanded they entrench themselves for a siege. The morale of the troops upon seeing such horrors deteriorated. In the day, the sheer stench of the bodies was unbearable, and the beating heat of the summer sun only amplified its putrid nature. Despite the Sultan's desire to capture and kill Dracula, he ordered a retreat due to the dwindling morale of his men. The sight alone had terrified the Sultan himself, yet he still vowed to kill the Impaler. Dracula fled across the Carpathian Mountains, deep into Wallachia. He kept sending messages to the Hungarian king for aid, yet unbeknownst to him, the Saxons had spread false evidence that the Impaler was embroiled within a conspiracy with the Ottomans. The Hungarian king, convinced by this news, arranged a meeting with Dracula, yet such would lead to the Impaler's imprisonment. Dracula would be in chains until the year 1471, until Stephen Bathory, the Moldavian prince, petitioned the king to release him, stating that he was the only hope of the Ottomans being defeated. All the while mortals bickered over their wars and politics, a great vampire council was summoned to discuss the Dracula problem. There were two great questions asked. Should he be destroyed, or should he be embraced? It was said that some kindred had been in contact with Dracula directly, especially the Zamishi Yorak and Counts Radu and Rustovich, who saw great promise in his power. Legends state that Dracula himself had selected Yorak to embrace him. Yet, as the tale goes, Yorak was betrayed by his own haven, the horrifying Cathedral of Flesh, which devoured him whole. The last years of Dracula's mortal life was spent at war. This final crusade was fought between him and the Sultan, with the aid of Prince Stephen's armies. The crusade was at first successful, having won major battles at Brazov, Bran Pass, and Bucharest, driving the nasty rulers from their seats of power, and taking Wallachia back from the Ottomans. However, Dracula's stability was quickly waning. When Prince Stephen's forces pulled out of Wallachia in 1479, Dracula was left vulnerable. He was left with a small army of 200, a force of which the Ottomans knew they could exploit. It is said that Vlad the Impaler fell in battle near Bucharest, decapitated at the age of 45, with his head presented in Istanbul for all to see. However, History within the world of darkness is not what meets the eye. Over the past years, Dracula's dealings with the occult had earned him a great many contacts across the world of Cainites. Aided by Zemishi revenants, his death upon the battlefield was a carefully staged event. This revenant, uncannily sculpted by the powers of vicissitude, took his place. It was Clan Zemishi who had foretold to Dracula of this incoming attack, and at the time his lands were overrun, Dracula was deep within Ponari Castle. 
There he fed upon the blood of Count Rostovich, becoming his ghoul, with the fiends of Clan Zamishi having high hopes that he would become yet another mortal pawn within their plot. This, however, did not go to plan. Vlad Tepes was, to the great dismay of the Zamishi, immune to the Blood Oath. He could not be controlled by Vitae, and thus only gained power from drinking vampiric blood. He learned as much as he could from the clan directly, but at the moment he could no longer tolerate the life of a ghoul, he devised a plan to induct himself into the society of vampires. Utilizing the same tactics he employed against Dan III, he captured two Zamishi kindred, being that of Tabak and the infamous Lambak Ruthven. These were two members of an emergent group known as the Sabat, and were ripe for exploiting into meeting Dracula's demands. As the story goes, Dracula forced Lambak to embrace him, turning Vlad the Impaler into a vampire of the sixth generation. Yet Dracula was not satiated. Turning on Tabak, he utilized the teachings of Durga's Sin to attain his goals of absolute power, diablerizing the fifth generation vampire and obtaining his potency of Vitae. In the centuries that passed, Dracula would become known as the most infamous kindred that ever entered on life, just as his father did before him. He would play the Camarilla and the Sabat against each other. He would master the rituals of Koldunic sorcery and would learn the arts of thaumaturgy to their limits. He cares little for the rules of vampire society and delights in his status as the most infamous vampire within the world of darkness. Thank you for watching. This video, as I say a lot, took a long time to make. This used a lot of different source books, but I primarily use materials from Transylvania Chronicles 2, which tends to miss out certain sections of Dracula's lore, which crop up in other places, such as Beckett's Jihad Diary, yada yada yada. There's a lot of Dracula lore out there that I was trying to incorporate from different places, uh, and it'll be interesting to see how it all kind of got stitched together. However, I do hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, consider leaving a like or subscribing. It would definitely mean a lot. Uh, and if you made it this far in the video, well done! This is a long one, so uh, I really hope you enjoyed it. Uh, leaving a like and supporting the channel by maybe even subscribing honestly does mean a lot. Uh, I really do appreciate um, all of your patronage. Uh, it, I, I, you know, it's, it's very humbling is what I want to say. <laughs> um, but yes, all of your support means the world to me. But as always, stay safe and do not wander naively into the night. <laughs>